you know, after that uh, wonderful uh, overview of Eugene Garfield's life and work, you might wonder why I'm here. I'm here, I never, I saw Eugene Garfield only once, and uh, that was when he gave the talk at the Institute. I thought he gave it here, but Arunachalam told me that he gave it in the library seminar hall. That was in 1975, and the Institute was a very different place in the mid-1970s. And uh, I already knew of Garfield when he came to the Institute, so I was present in the lecture. And I realized even then, I didn't know about scientometrics. Uh, I'm not an information scientist. But I'm a chemist, and uh, in chemistry you deal with large amounts of information. And I later realized that Garfield also began as a chemist and found ways of treating the large amounts of information that one generates in a chemistry laboratory. He learned this in Hammert's lab, as uh, David Pendlebury's just pointed it out. When I came to Bangalore, we were also dealing with index cards. Uh, in those days, India used to be about 20 years behind, uh, so what was being done in America in the 1950s would be done in India in the 1970s. Today, it's not quite so. And so we did have index cards, we did have punched cards, and we would have great difficulty in trying to sort out the innumerable number of references that you would get in chemistry. Chemistry, this problem has always been there because chemistry is a very mature subject. Beilstein started in Germany a long time ago, and chemical abstracts started off in the United States uh, a very long time ago. And uh, those of us who were young, our first job was always to go and look for information in chemical abstracts. Uh, I don't think there's anybody here who has actually gone and looked at chemical abstracts, probably with the exception of Arun over here. Uh, if you need to look at chemical abstracts, you need to be strong because they're heavy, you need to lift them off library shelves, and you need to go through pages and pages and pages of printed information. So this was the condition in which I really began my research career. And so when I came to the Indian Institute of Science, I realized that one of the most important things was that you needed journals, uh, you needed uh, references, you needed papers to read, and journals would appear in the Institute library slowly. In those days, everything used to come by surface mail, and it would take probably about six months to get here. And then there was this remarkable device which appeared in the library, and that was current contents. Today, it's only when I saw David Pendlebury's slide that I realized that current contents life sciences was actually started off somewhere in the mid-1960s. And I first saw it in the mid-1970s when it appeared in the library. It would appear once a week, and it would appear on Thursdays. All the new journals in the library would be put out on Thursdays. So if you wanted to go and read journals in the library, you would promptly go there at about 3.30 in the afternoon when the journals were put out. The journals would be new, and there was always a pleasure in looking through new journals. Even if you didn't understand what you read inside them, you would like to feel them. Feeling the Journal of the American Chemical Society or feeling the Journal of Biological Chemistry was a special pleasure in those days. But current contents, the journals would be put out, but the library of the institute wouldn't put out current contents. Current contents would be kept under the table of uh, the counter supervisor. And there would be a sheet on which you would have to sign and take the current contents, and the time at which you returned it uh, would be recorded so that the copy did not get lost, and there was only one copy. It turned out there were a few people who were dedicated readers of current contents, and I was one. I realized then that if I were to describe Garfield at the very end, what would I describe him at? I would describe him as a watcher of science and scientists. He watched science, he watched scientists, and he found ways in which other people could also watch science and scientists and how science transformed. Why was he able to do this? He was able to do this because scientists wrote papers. I always wondered why did scientists write papers? 
And then I found this wonderful quote of Lewis Carroll, actually written under his, uh, not under his pseudonym, but, but under his real name in a letter. Uh, uh, Charles Dodson wrote this. He said, the proper definition of a man is an animal that writes letters. And this is a 19th century description of a man. Uh, the 21st century would be a man who's on WhatsApp or uh, on Twitter. I would define scientists then as animals who like to write papers. So once they begin to write papers, then of course everything that Carfield does becomes apparent. You organize papers. Current contents was very valuable to us. It was valuable to us because we got the title page of the current journals. We also had at the back of current contents an index, which may not have been very important in the United States, but it was very important in other parts of the world. You had the address of the author for correspondence. So we would take uh, cards to the library, fill out the author's name and address, go across the road to the post office, and then I remember we used to buy the brightest and most picturesque Indian stamps which are available to stick on those in the hope that the person who received this card would be would like stamps, would collect them, and would then be kindly disposed towards the sender, and would not only send us the reference that we asked for, we would add at the bottom, and any related papers. So we would look forward uh, with great joy to the postman coming to deliver a bundle, and this is how information was actually transmitted and how research was actually done. Uh, unfortunately, there are very, very few uh, uh, students in the audience, but occasionally it helps students to know how research used to be done and the kind of technologies which were then in use. And current contents was, I think, a most wonderful invention. It was so simple in concept. Garfield's famous paper in science, which many say as the foundational paper for scientometrics, the start of the science citation index, we've already seen that. And uh, he of course says there that it will help in many ways, but one should not expect it to solve all our problems. And this, I think, is uh, a fact that Garfield used to emphasize throughout his writings. Every one of the products, I think, I heard the word product for the first time, because these were in fact products, uh, they were products of an entrepreneur. Uh, they were products which made money, which made other products possible. But they also made a great deal of uh, discovery possible. He says, for instance, about the Science Citation Index when he wrote in Nature, that it was, its first objective was to break out of the so-called subject index barrier. But he says that out of this bibliographic experiment has evolved a historiographic and sociometric tool of major importance. Like most other scientific discoveries, this tool can be used or widely abused. It is now up to the scientific community to prevent abuse of the Science Citation Index by devoting the necessary attention to its proper and judicious exploitation. This was in 1970. Almost 30 years before, I first heard in India the terrible phrase, the average impact factor. And uh, this was pioneered by the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research. But like every virus, it spread through the community. It spread very, very quickly. And uh, Garfield, I think even in 1970, had realized the possibilities of misuse of the Science Citation Index. It's almost like Oppenheimer after watching the first atomic explosion, uh, quoting from the Bhagavad Gita. Garfield watched scientists. And today, if you look at the bottom cartoon which I've picked from uh, the internet, you will find scientists are being watched by lots of people. They're being watched by government, they're being watched by politicians, and they're being watched by media. Nowhere is this more true than in India today. Uh, David Pendlebury uh, mentioned in passing the problem of rankings. He used two words, uh, two, I, which really touched a chord in me. One was the impact factor and the other was the rankings. I have dealt with both of these. 
As editor of Current Science, I was always faced with the question, why does your journal have such a low impact factor? And as director of the Indian Institute of Science, for years I answered this question, or didn't answer this question, tried to smile it away, why does your institution not figure in the top 100 universities of the world? These are questions which are still asked, but uh, I have never found an answer, but everybody is watching you. And the way they grade performance is very often by using the tools which in fact were developed while Garfield tried to develop these tools as measures for studying the sociology, the history, the intellectual development of ideas, our governments, politicians and administrators took to these very same tools to use them to study individual scientists, to study individual institutions. Richard Feynman said this about ornithologists. He said, uh, philosophy of science is about as useful to scientists as ornithology is to birds. And uh, the question, of course, is how useful are science watchers to scientists? And it will turn out that science watchers have a very prof have had, and Garfield was the preeminent science watcher, science watchers have really influenced the practice of science. Ornithologists can never influence the behavior of birds. I don't know what Richard Feynman would have said about uh, the Science Citation Index, but I suspect uh, that he didn't have an opportunity, at least I couldn't find anything on the internet. I'm sure he would have said something that would be worth quoting. The library. I must say a word about the library of the Indian Institute of Science where I first met Garfield. I met Garfield in person in the library of the Indian Institute of Science in its seminar hall. But I met Garfield through his writings in the library of the Indian Institute of Science. Libraries were wonderful places in the 1970s. And I quote R.K. Narayan who wrote this in the 1950s. He says that the faint aroma of gum and calico that hangs about a library is as the fragrance of incense to me. I think the most beautiful sight is the gilt-edged back of a row of books on a shelf. Today, where I saw Shepherd Citation Index, uh, the picture, and also the Science Citation Index, all I wanted to ask David Pendlebury was, can I have those slides? They're so wonderful to see them. But in the library of the Indian Institute of Science, there was one bound copy of the Science Citation Index in the 1970s because it was too expensive. We couldn't buy them. I used to go there on Sunday afternoons and pick up this. It looked like a dictionary, but you would, it was alphabetically arranged. I don't remember quite. I can go back and check, but I think it was only the one volume of the letter M which was there. But you could then find uh, scientists whose names began with M and you could see what they had published. And just like some people like to read dictionaries, uh, I liked to look at the Science Citation Index. And I also used to wonder at that time, would my name ever appear over there? Because I hadn't yet published uh, too many papers. This was what the current contents pages looked like. I uh, had great difficulty getting these, but uh, these were really wonderful. They made, uh, they inspired us really to do research at that time. But when I was editor of Current Science, I wrote many, many editorials. I didn't write as many columns as Garfield did, maybe one third. But I came to the subject of impact factors and scientometric several times. I picked just a few of them. You will look at their titles and you will see that I've had this love-hate relationship with the impact factors. I've, for example, written an editorial called Who's Afraid of Im Impact Factors? Sort of taking off from the old uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf kind of uh, title. And these I did because there were people in India misusing impact factors a great deal. Impact factors were misused in the 1990s. They were misused even more in the first decade of the 21st century. And I think they're being misused maximally now in the second decade of the 21st century. 
and uh, I don't know uh, what we're going to do. The result of this is that in 2008, I wrote an editorial which didn't make it very popular among uh, information scientists, which said that scientometrics is a real dismal science, because it actually makes people preoccupied with citations, with their place in the world of science. The journal impact factor is something that's been mentioned. This is what is one of Garfield's creations, which has in fact turned out to be a double-edged sword. But the journal impact factor has its origins in this paper, which I thought I would show you. This is a 1927 paper on college libraries and once again chemical education, because it is chemistry which was most developed. And since there are one or two physicists here in the audience, I would say this, that if you look at the, at the 19th century, it was chemistry which was very much more developed than physics. German chemistry had already a large number of journals. It had a large amount of very, very useful information, chemical procedures, chemical synthesis, which had been documented. And the problem which these two authors uh, grappled with was how do you order journals to a college library, because a college in America could not attract very good faculty. And if it wanted to attract faculty who wanted to do research, they would need journals. The faculty, according to this paper, needed to develop intellectually. Professor Abhinandan would say, today you don't ask this question. You don't ask what is needed for your faculty to develop intellectually. You assume that when you recruit them, they've already developed intellectually and they don't develop any further once they are in fact within the portals of a distinguished institution like this one. But here it is. This is the operational table. What did they do? They took one volume of the Journal of the American Chemical Society of 1926. And then they counted the number of citations. They must have done this physically in those days. And it is something that can be done. And they asked the question, which are the journals which cited the American Chemical Society most frequently? How much impact did the American Chemical Society have on those journals? Which would mean that those journals should also be read by American chemists who were now publishing in the American Chemical Society. I will tell you the results of one experiment which was done when I was the director of the Indian Institute of Science. We wanted to discontinue publications in the library. So I asked a colleague of mine who was good at this uh, to take the science, uh, to take, go to the web of science and ask the question, which are all the journals in which the faculty of the institute publish their papers? And also ask the question, which are all the journals that the faculty of the Indian Institute of Science cite in their papers. Now, if you aggregate all of these, this would be the sum total of journals which you might actually then actually buy for the library. And all journals in which we never published and all journals which we never cited, we probably could sort of cut them out. But of course, if you made a list of journals and sent them out to the faculty, Everybody will say that a journal in which they don't publish and a journal in which they don't ever cite, which means they never read it or never found anything worthwhile in it, they will still mark it saying that it should be retained by the library. And so since we were struggling to uh, optimize library budgets, what I told them was once we circulate this list, but after a period of about six months, we just quietly discontinue all the journals. This was one use that we did make of the web of science. We did discontinue a lot of journals, saved a couple of crores of rupees for the library, and it turned out that nobody ever complained. Because nobody ever noticed. And uh, I therefore like this 1927 paper because the problem with which these librarians grappled with in 1927, I grappled with 80 years later in 2007. And uh, this is exactly 2017, so we're celebrating the 90th anniversary of this paper. And as luck would have it, if I go back to the previous slide, yesterday when I made this slide, I found that it was published on October the 28th, so we're almost exactly 90 years since the publication of this paper. Look at the journals there. Berishte on top, the Journal of the Chemical Society from London uh, below that, all the German journals, uh, Annalen, Zeitschrift for Physical, there's even a physics journal up there, the Annalen der Physik, and so physics, chemistry, they were being cited uh, uh, 
This was the kind, you could see Nature Science and PNAS, which are some of our most popular journals today, are right there at the bottom of the list. This was 1927. Of course, you can use the H index or the Hirsch index uh, to rank journals, not only individuals. And here's a Hirsch index ranking of journals very much later, using 2001 papers in a 2005. Now you can see everything's changed around. There's no German uh, uh, journal on this list. But any historian of science, or I would say any historian, would really look at these two tables and might ask the question some years later. What happened between the 1920s and uh, the year 2000 to completely transform the world? And then, of course, you would have a great deal to analyze. Germany after the First World War was still the center of science. Germany after the Second World War was no longer the same kind of center of science that it was before. Citation counting, everybody's written about the use and abuse of impact factors. One of the most poorly understood features of the impact factor which Garfield wrote repeatedly about was that impact factors vary across fields, they vary across uh, disciplines, so one must be very, very careful. But Garfield also produced tables like these. It's tables like these which really I used to love to see them in the essays in uh, current contents. This is one which appeared in 1988, I think, or somewhere thereabouts. And uh, it turns out he used a lot of data. We didn't have, uh, we didn't know where all this data was obtained from. The science citation index was not available over here. And uh, you can see which are the most cited papers. The top 20 papers had greater than 10,000 citations. These were what I would call uh, the Tendulkers and the Bradmans of uh, science, if I can use a cricket metaphor, or these were the Federers and Nadals of uh, science, if one uses a tennis metaphor. I, unfortunately, these were probably the Babe Ruths of uh, science, if you count the number of home runs that they hit. There were only 20 of them. So it would not automatically, uh, if you were curious, you would want to know who are those 20 people. What are those 20 papers? And this is what Garfield, week after week in current contents, he would produce an essay. Every other week you would find that he had something like this, and there was a wealth of interesting information. There was also something else that was interesting. It was found that 82% of the scientific literature at that time actually attracted zero citations. And I interpreted this as if the author of the paper had published a second paper, he didn't even cite himself. Because self-citations, I believe, were not removed at this point in time. So this meant that there were authors who didn't even cite their own work, so they could hardly expect other people to cite their work, and 82% of the literature. This also tells you that the 80-20 rule is alive and well, uh, even in all this data. I found this when I was writing the Frontline article and uh, put this in there, and this was in 2005. Garfield had produced yet another. Now the greater than 10,000 has gone to 61. So you can see that between the late 80s, maybe in a period of about uh, 20, 25 years, uh, greater than 10,000 citations, we've gone only from 20 to 60. So you can now try to use this data to ask the question, when will there be a century of authors who have accumulated more than 10,000 citations? But we are still pretty good as far as uh, the no citation uh, papers are concerned. But the problem with quantitative measures is this, that scientists begin to compare themselves. The H index has become uh, a device by which you should almost give scientists a t-shirt which has their H index emblazoned on it. You know, Chris Gale has a number which is the maximum number of runs he scored in an innings which is emblazoned on his uh, costume that he wears when he plays in the IPL. Now, a, a graduate student here in the physics department drew this cartoon for me for current science many years ago where there is a meeting of scientists and he uh, one of the observers says it's not such a good idea to make seating arrangements according to the impact factors of their published papers because this is effectively a uh, scientist sometimes preening like peacocks uh, boasting about their edge indices. But uh, Garfield's work now has assumed great importance because now you can see that uh, 
uh, nature had this wonderful graphic on the paper mountain. I, I believe that if you stack the first page of every paper that's been published, it will reach the height of Mount Kilimanjaro. I don't know how they really managed to make this estimate, but it is a wonderful estimate. And there, right at the peak of the mountain, you will fight the top 100. I then wondered, when I used to read all of this, what do the rest of us do? If you are not there among the most cited, if you don't appear, then I found this wonderful Garfield quotation in an essay that he wrote in 1970. He said that the growth of science is dependent upon an accumulation of many, fortunately he put the word mediocre in quotes, mediocre results that are produced by hard work. And then he added, long live the mediocrities, without them how could they be geniuses? And uh, this of course then gives everyone in science a reason to continue doing what they're doing because that's the way science actually progresses. I think uh, my friend Arun put this uh, with a quote in uh, a paper that he wrote in Current Science. He quoted Chairman Mao, I think, who I think one should quote because now you find that President Xi is so much in the news as the most powerful man in the world. So finally it looks that Chairman Mao finally won out in the end. So we might as well follow his advice. Uh, when we live in a world uh, of Trump and uh, Brexit and Catalonia, uh, Chairman Mao at least appears to signify stability and progress. And he says that every quality manifests itself in a certain quantity, and without quantity there can be no quality. Therefore we must have scientists publishing a large number of papers, and from those papers you will find some papers of very, very quality which do appear. Uh, David Pendlebury did uh, say many things about, he had a slide with wonderful quotations on measurements. I like this one in nature, uh, was a critique of again, uh, scientometric uh, quantitative metrics. He says institutions have a misguided sense of the fairness of decisions reached by algorithm. Unable to measure what they want to maximize, which is quality, they will maximize what they can measure. This is in fact one of the problems. But from all those wonderful uh, analysis of the literature using citation measures, one can come across gems. You find, for instance, the most cited paper of all time is Oliver Lowry's paper on the estimation of proteins. It still is. It will never be beaten. Because everybody reads that, uh, uses the Lowry estimation without ever having read the Lowry paper. And this is where I think Merton's quotes on citations as a moral imperative and all no longer have any relevance in the second decade of the 21st century. Today citations are meant to pass editors and uh, citations are meant to ensure respectability of papers. So if you're using a method, you must cite the paper, you don't have to read it. I have that picture up on top of Lowry's first page only to show those students who have never read the Lowry paper, this is what the Lowry paper's first page really looked. But there is, for instance, a paper by an Indian scientist who worked in the United States, uh, Yella Pragada Suvarao, who in fact is discovered largely by uh, uh, a journalist in India, S.P.K. Gupta, who wrote this book, but independently discovered uh, in the Garfield analysis as being rank 23 at the time that this was done because he did the phosphate estimation which everybody uses. Today of course you can use other methods. Technology is what Garfield anticipated. I think what was said is correct. Garfield was a true visionary because in the 1950s one would not have anticipated the computer revolution. One could not have anticipated the internet. One could never have anticipated the kind of technologies which would be available for connecting information. Nevertheless, collecting, organizing that information was the key to the web of science as it uh, evolved in later years. Today, for example, the Google Scholar ranking. And here, when I wrote in Frontline, it turns out that some of the methods that Garfield used, the page rank algorithm uh, on which Google's really based, Stanford University's famous patent, the intellectual origins of the Google PageRank algorithm are really in Garfield's work. Here you can see something which don't appear from the web of science, 
Uh, for example, number nine, which I've colored in red, is Claude Shannon's famous paper on the mathematical theory of communication, which you can really take as the starting point of the information age. And uh, if, that is, if 1948 is the year of birth of, the inf of information technology, you can trace it back to Shannon's. But Shannon's paper would really appear, which is a report in the Bell uh, Telephone Laboratories, it would appear only in the kind of searches which are now possible uh, uh, through Google. Citation tracking allows us to study the sociology of science. It allows fields to be mapped by cluster analysis, but impact factors have had a major role, not only why citation tracking allows you to study the sociology of science, impact factors have begun to have a major influence on the sociology of science. Today, there are many pernicious problems in science. There's directed citation, because if you guess that your paper is going to go to a certain referee, it's better to put those papers of the referee in your reference list. So directed reference lists are now a norm among practicing scientists, although they will not admit it. You can also direct your papers to referees by putting in uh, references to those referees towards whom you would like the editor to send the paper. And there are editors who require, when papers are revised, that citations to their journal be added to papers which have appeared in their journal so that the impact factor of their journals. And you can sympathize with editors because they need to sell their journal. Uh, uh, their publishers ask them, why is your impact factor so low? And therefore, everybody is, in fact, doing this. But I will come to the end of my presentation by showing you this particular current comments uh, essay uh, of Eugene Garfield, which appeared in 1986. This was called The Mapping of Cholera Research and the Impact of Sambunath Day of Calcutta, where I read this first in the library of this institute. When I read it, I was immediately taken by this, because here was an Indian scientist who appeared to have done the most wonderful work, such that Garfield wrote an essay about him. And this is probably one of the early examples in which Garfield actually found an unknown scientist and the, and the centrality of his work to the field of cholera. He was guided to this by Joshua Lederberg. And uh, Joshua Lederberg, actually there was a letter from Joshua Lederberg, uh, which Arunachalam actually found in the National Library of Medicine, uh, uh, in, his correspondence. in his personal correspondence. It's now there on the Lederberg archives in the National Library of Medicine. He found this letter, and it appeared from this letter that Lederberg had in fact nominated S.N. Day for the Nobel Prize in Medicine. Now, I'm showing you just two figures from this paper, because it's customary for scientists to show figures in tables from their papers. This is what is called the multidimensional scaling map on the left, and the historiograph on the right. Now, in that historiograph, in those rectangles, in three of those boxes, you will find asterisks, and those boxes are the ones in which SN Day's papers were core papers. You will also find SN Day's paper, uh, the area in which SN Day work, as the core from which the rest of the network uh, really evolved. So when I saw this, uh, I was young, and when you're young, you still have a romantic view of science. Uh, I did not know anything about SN Day, and I thought, here there is this unknown scientist who actually from Calcutta has done work which will one day fetch him a Nobel Prize. But I did not know him. I did not know who he was. No. Two years later, in 1988, uh, Professor Ramaseshan, who had then taken over as the editor of Current Science, arrived in my laboratory one day and said that he's taken over as the editor of Current Science and would I join him and help him out a little bit because the journal's a mess. Uh, so I thought, yes, uh, I like to do clerical work, and I'm a good clerk. And uh, in fact, Arun Achillam said what he shares with Garfield. I must say the only thing when I read about, uh, when I heard about Garfield's earlier work, he began his work as a clerk. So I think it's very important to be clerical. And I was good at clerical work. Ram Seshan had been director of the Indian Institute of Science, so he recognized a good clerk in his younger faculty. And... Uh, he uh, recruited me to this job, and uh, he said, look, we don't have enough papers to publish. How are we going to publish a journal which appears fortnightly? 
and uh, I didn't know, and he had been my director, I just kept quiet. And then he said, maybe we can do one thing, we can produce special issues, uh, where we decide what the subject is, we ask people to write, and then we put all of this together. And then with a gleam in his eye, he said, you know, if you get enough people to write for an issue, our issue will be somewhat thick. And then if it is somewhat thick, we can say that both numbers of a given month appear in that issue, and we will then save printing costs also. And so he said, why don't you think of some special issues to do? So I had just read about Dale, fresh in my mind, and I said, we can do a special issue on Shambhunath Day, we can do another special issue on G.N. Ramachandran, whose work I know well. And uh, so he said, wonderful, why don't you do this? So I went away in 1988, and then it took me all of two years. I spent two years researching Shambhunath Day, finding out who were the people who knew him, and wrote letters to them. And to my surprise, everybody in the field of cholera to whom I wrote a letter immediately agreed to write an article for this then unknown and really struggling Indian journal. I wrote to Lederberg, and Lederberg promptly said that he would write, and I didn't know any of them. Uh, I very rarely traveled anywhere, so I didn't know anyone. Uh, the one quality which I do not share with Garfield is I have no ability to network with anybody. So I uh, stayed put at my desk, but it turned out that my, the response that I got was absolutely remarkable. So two, after two years uh, in which my colleagues thought that I was in fact uh, being completely stupid uh, to waste two years of uh, the prime years of my scientific career uh, in doing something like this, uh, we put together this special issue, and I looked at the citation analyses at that time of SN Day, and I was fascinated by the fact that two papers that he published in Journal of Pathology and Bacteriology in 1953 and in Nature in 1959. And remember, Nature was not that important a journal in 1959. It was an important journal, but it wasn't the most important journal. And uh, Garfield had found these papers, but the people in the field of cholera in India had not found these papers. Nobody who was there in India really seemed to know very much about uh, SN Day. And here is what uh, Garfield uh, wrote. And I have a different quotation here from the one that David Pendlebury showed. He says, there are some parallels between Barbara McClintock, the 1983 Nobel Prize winner in medicine, and Day. McClintock is prone to seclusion and intellectual isolation, as was Day. What Garfield did not know was that McClintock was prone to intellectual isolation and seclusion in the United States. Day was not prone to in seclusion. Day, by the fact that he worked in the Neil Ratan Sarkar Medical College in Kolkata, under very trying circumstances, was intellectually isolated and secluded by accident. As a man, he was a person who was very friendly. In fact, he did much of his work in another laboratory in the Bose Institute, where he had managed to find somebody to help him. He said, but while McClintock was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, Day was never elected a fellow of any Indian academy and never received any major award. By this time, I had been elected to the Indian Academy of Sciences, and it really struck me. If someone like me can be elected to the Indian Academy of Sciences, and someone like Day is not elected to the Indian Academy of Sciences, he doesn't tell me very much about Day. It tells me a great deal about the Indian Academy of Sciences. And uh, what it tells me is not something that is very complimentary to the Academy itself. But Day was invited in 1978 to a Nobel Symposium. This was before Garfield found him, because Lederberg had already found him. And uh, at the Nobel Symposium, he was asked to give the concluding talk, because much of the symposium was really based on cholera research, uh, which had its origins in, in the fact that they really found that uh, discovered the cholera enterotoxin. Because he discovered the cholera enterotoxin, it turned out that uh, the treatment for cholera was really just oral rehydration. And if you just waited long enough, uh, the patient would simply get better. All you had to do them was to keep them hydrated and well. And there he says, chairman and friends, before I conclude, 
I wish to make a few personal remarks. I have been dead since the early 1960s. I have been exhumed by the Nobel Symposium Committee, and these two days with you make me feel that I'm coming to life again. Uh, they died uh, shortly before in 1985, uh, shortly before uh, the Garfield article appeared uh, in current content. So he never really did see this. But uh, neither did any of us know about Day's invitations to the Nobel Symposium or what he said in the Nobel Symposium in those days because communication was not this good. The internet did not exist. Uh, if you didn't see the proceedings of that symposium, which would be a bound book, uh, you would never find this. So in many ways, uh, I would say Garfield introduced sometimes Indian scientists to major Indian work. There is another write up, and I think it was definitely by Garfield because it remains fresh in my mind, but search as I might, I have not been able to find this. I remember somewhere, maybe it was in The Scientist, I don't know where, but there was an article which he wrote. And the title or the first line of the article was, or the last line of the article, because that's what really makes one uh, stays in your memory, he says, will the real S. Chandrasekhar please stand up? And uh, what he really meant was, he was looking at the citations of Subramanian Chandrasekhar, the famous astrophysicist who won a Nobel Prize in the 1980s. And Subramanian Chandrasekhar was a revered figure uh, on the Indian scientific scene, even long before he won the Nobel Prize. But in our very surroundings, right across the street here at the Raman Research Institute, there was another Chandrasekhar, actually Subramaniam Chandrasekhar's nephew or cousin, uh, Sri Ramakrishna Chandrasekhar. They both had the same initial S. If you expand it, it was different. And uh, so when Garfield looked at uh, all of this, you found two clusters, one in the field of astrophysics, another in the field of liquid crystals, where the major discovery of the discotic liquid crystals had been made here at the Raman Research Institute. So when he found this, he then realized that these two people were two different people. Now you can see the advantages of what citation tracking and citation mapping can do. It can really teach you a great deal about science and scientists. And I thought this was most exciting uh, when I read about this. Today, for example, if you look at some journals, I found a paper in a computer science journal which asked the question, which is the author's name, which appears the maximum number of times in the scientific literature. And this turns out, I think, to be the name Kim. And it's one of the Korean names. because, And therefore, how do you now distinguish who did what? when you have all the data uh, into your computers. So sometimes the degeneracy of name, there's degeneracy of uh, even the first name. And so you now have no way of sorting this out unless you do some kind of geographical sorting by the addresses. So I think I'll come back to this cartoon because I'm going to end now. Did Garfield really have an influence on the science and scientists. What is Eugene Garfield's impact on science and scientists themselves? I think it was enormous. He, in fact, influenced the way scientists behave. In physics, there is this oft-referred-to problem of the observer effect, where the very act of observation itself can have an influence on the phenomenon that you are, in fact, trying to measure. So the measurement itself, the act of measurement itself, affects the measurement. And you will find uh, people discussing this in the literature. I think that Cartoon says it very well. But in a paper published, there is experimental evidence for this. There are papers discussed in the literature, a 1998 paper, which is summarized in this blog over here. But I think Garfield has had a major impact. Today, it turns out that the Science Citation Index and the Web of Science have a much greater impact on the behavior of scientists, the manner in which scientists practice science. 
even a graduate student at the Indian Institute of Science and in countless institutions across the world, faculty members coming out for tenure, potential Nobel laureates wanting to attract the attention of the Nobel Committee. All of them now will have to decide, where is it do you publish your paper? Which are the most influential journals in which to publish? Where is your paper going to acquire? Which journal has the highest impact factor? There was a very recent article by Randy Sheckman, a recent Nobel laureate in Nature, in which he argued against publishing in Nature and Science. People who then had uncomplimentary things to say about him said that, look, you can say this because you've now won the Nobel Prize. Because even award committees, tenure committees, promotion committees, appointment committees, everybody is influenced by this. So I think Garfield's had a profound influence on science and scientists. It's not the kind of influence that he would have liked to have. Because I think throughout his writings, one thing is clear. He introduced these tools so that you can study science. You can study the development of science. You can study the sociology of science, the history of science, the intellectual development of ideas. But that's not the way in which most of us are, in fact, using these tools. And then as a final tribute to Garfield, I will show you this. I searched the internet yesterday to see if I could find a nice picture. The internet's a wonderful device. Garfield could have never imagined its power when he wrote his first paper or his most influential paper in 1955. You can see that uh, this is how his publications have gone. I guess this is how his appearance has also changed over the years. And uh, I think in celebrating uh, Garfield's life, one can do no better than to say that if you ask the question, in the 20th century and maybe the early part of the 20th century, who has had the greatest impact on the way scientists look at science and look at themselves, I think that man would be Eugene Garfield. Thank you.